It's time for something really important. Fat men talking about games they don't really understand, played by people they don't know. I'm your host, Gary. Oh, hey, I didn't see it. I'm just hearing the void, listening to the best sports Let's podcast I can find from the 1990s. Scandals involving preschool soccer moms. Ah, ah, soccer moms. And the national finals. No matter. Now that you're here, I can talk about what's been on my mind for the past week. Jock culture. I have no idea why it started to interest me. You can see from me standing here, I never go to the gym and sit somewhere either complaining or lecturing people. Maybe I should be a sports commentator. Mom might have been right. Enough of that, though. You're probably more interested in jock culture itself, so I'll save us both the time and effort and see if the title card is still in the penalty box. The story will continue after this. Jock is a term for anyone involved in athletics. It's more a Canadian and American term, and I have rarely seen it used outside of these two nations. Aside from names and a term for Scots, the idea of the jock is present in a lot of Western culture, even without the name. To classify a jock, the sport doesn't matter. They could be the rich kid from Double Bay who only plays tennis with his mates on the weekend, the competitive basketball girl from the Midwest who has more sports scholarships than fingers, or even Ned. I don't have to explain Ned. All that matters is their active participation in that sport and, you could say, their enjoyment in doing so. So where does this term come from? There are two possible origins for the term jock. The first, and more accepted, is from the male undergarment known as a jock strap. The jock strap itself got its name from being short for jockey strap, and was used in the late 19th century by bicycle couriers and other people. The other origin comes from a word I think I'm too far in the video runtime to say. Eh, why not? Hmm, phallus. Funny enough, the term jock was a nickname for those named John in Scotland, so the English may be at hand for that phallic reference. Now, the history behind jocks is somewhat short, so we're going to get through it fast. Buckle up. There's going to be a lot of clips coming out of everywhere, and I've run out of creative content after the whole Ned thing. So everyone will be happy to know that Wikipedia didn't have much on the term jock. So I have taken it upon myself and the team to look into the history of sports culture and why people are obsessed with it. And why you can get into college when you throw a ball good, but not when you're a raccoon who speaks English and wants to learn cultural anthropology and linguistics. Sport culture itself is something that has existed within a lot of human history. So where to start? Oh no! There's going to be a timer in the bottom right the minute I start talking about sport culture. Okay. Uh, the sport culture we know starts back in ancient Greece and Rome, with both empires having a distinct love of shirtless men. Fast forward to around the Enlightenment, and you get teams that form for sports like wrestling, football, and eventually games like basketball and baseball post-industrial revolution. It wouldn't be till America's Gilded Age where we got the professional and youth sports groups that we see today. College teams for Ivy League schools and East Coast boarding schools set media standards for a lot of athletes at the time, as well-rounded and affable. Maybe even a bit rascally, but sports would go more mainstream near the World Wars, as during the 1930s, several national youth athletic associations were created to govern high school and some collegiate programs. After the World Wars, and with the development of suburbs and concentrated schools, we see organized sports becoming more a part of many students' lives. This continues on strong through this day. How fast was that? <coughs> Thanks, convenient number above my head. Probably not that accurate, but sport culture is a broad topic. That was fast though, right? Oh. Some Kenyan runners, a Russian gymnast, and a Jamaican bobsled team beat the time already? Oh well, that's sports records for ya. Sport culture is something that we will cover more when we talk about the athlete subculture, but I'll talk about it here just to keep us all on the same page. Sport culture, from the participant's side, is more, well, a hobby or even a job where thousands of people watch their every move. Of course, they too were in the audience once, until some big star came onto the field or screen and they or their parents were like, oh. Big muscly man make money. Child, go make money doing sport. Of course that's an extreme. Jock culture is created and maintained in high school and colleges, with members who usually love what they do. So what about these modern jocks and their cultures? Modern jocks are more of a youth subculture, usually more prevalent in high school and colleges where organized sports are easier to get into. On average, there are 8 million American teenagers taking part in at least one sport every year. The culture itself is not far from athlete culture. They usually present themselves in both institutions as cliques, sticking to their own kind. But even there, there's some subdivision. But with that division comes camaraderie. Most jocks will stick loyally to their fellow athletes. And some of them even keep friendships well after college. To save me the sanity of writing this of crunch culture, jock culture is just a stereotyped lens on athlete culture. And from what all you've seen in whatever teen drama you're binging right now, it's kind of like that. Teen culture usually has many of them where the prevalent subcultures are identities. So jocks are easy to spot. Just don't go about a high school with a fifth helmet taking notes as buff students walk around you. Don't worry, I only got five weeks community service for that. 
All right, we're going to get back on track. Why do jocks do jock things? And not just what we see in the movies, either. Well, most people do it out of a feeling of accomplishment or even just a love of the activity. Athletes, mostly young, aspire to be the very best like no one ever was. They train day and night, after school or even during it, all to one day make it to the big leagues. This aspiration to make it big, brought on by some idol, need for high achievement, or maybe just an obsession with the hit anime kickers, helps share these young minds in the right direction. Their parents also do this, in a never-ending cycle. If your mom or dad did sports in high school, there's a good chance that you signed up for sports before you could even legally do all these things. Because mine did just that. And it's out of this push by their parents that a lot of future jocks get into this subculture. They're set into something that either the parents think would be fun or a good way to make friends, and they begin to excel at it. Now how do you know about jocks? Was it because you played sports, were bullied by athletes in high school? Or how about just because you watched one too many movies and TV shows from between 1970 and 2000? For the sake of brevity, we're going off the last one. As you know from a lot of media of the time, the jock stereotype was seen as an antagonistic figure for the nerd or uncool kid to overcome and get the prom queen. While it is a reasonable stereotype, the strong, rich, and dumb athlete being a stand-in for a lot of power structures, it has lost credibility of research in recent years. At least in college, and I believe some high schools, where jocks are taught more of the balanced body and mind. A study from 2005, that is too statistical for me to fully read, found that there is no correlation between lower GPAs and sports performances in high school students, aside from the elephant in the room of students in four or more sports activities having lower GPAs, possibly due to time constraints and stress. Why do I bring this up? Well, if you ever mention jock culture, this stereotype will more often pop up in the mind of whoever you talk to. And that in of itself is a criticism of the jock subculture. It's perpetuating a stereotype that existed once and influenced the pop culture of the last 50 years. But how did that stereotype come about? Well, from the sources the team and I looked into, it's kind of vague. Popular culture in the West, since at least the 70s and 80s, has set the jock up as the big bad guy for the nerd or outcast to overcome, or even as comedic relief. We have seen this kind of jock, a dumb and buff rich kid who usually doubles as the bully to the nerd or outcast and their group. He's usually paired with the popular girl and both are played to an egocentric extreme. Up for the 90s with films like these, this stereotype continued, but would be subverted in the 2010s, more out of a postmodern reflection on the archetype. But this doesn't stop the occasional show from using a jock when a dumb but strong and popular character is needed. And when the jock is set as the protagonist, is usually character development towards a new social understanding, like in Breakfast Club and other works. But the stereotype is still there, even more intended to show the audience that there are character arcs even for dumb lunks. If anything, it's more the fans who are the dumb lunks than the jock. Don't even get me started on fanatics of any team. Hooligans are more of a jock stereotype than the jocks themselves. Hey, uh, post-writing Mick here. Don't mind me cutting into a paragraph I wrote. I did a second run through on modern jock culture and found an obvious issue I did not bring up. There is concern that jock culture is overly achievement-oriented and puts a lot of pressure on the youths, even outside locker rooms and practice fields. Now jock culture is understandably over-masculine, maybe even hyper-masculine if you're going to use a gender studies term. Concerns raised by Robert Lipsight point towards coaches in most cases, claiming that they, as well as parents and school staff, see sports as emotional and financial gain, but he sees it as child exploitation, maybe even abuse. Young jocks are promised fame, power, success, all things I brought up in the Why They Do That segment, but Lipsight argues that parents are behind the actions of their coaches, some out of a desire to live through their children, and others out of wanting to see their kid do great. It's an effective sport culture that permeated itself from professional sports and moved into youth sports. Sort of an over-competitioning of something that is just fun for kids. This gets way out of hand, and I'll just leave a link to Lipsight's whole article in the sources. With that out of the way, back to the program. Jock culture is intertwined of sports and athlete culture, for understandable reasons, and it only seemed the influence that a fan and the big dumb jock would interact once more. There you have it. That's jocks. Big, strong, and generally affable people who like to mess with balls or discs because they enjoy it. The stereotype may hold itself in popular culture for some time more, mostly in teen dramas, but it's becoming more of a trope for the sake of it or to be subverted. Actual jocks are normal people, with more muscles, who see sport as their way of self-fulfillment. And who are we to stop them, especially if they're built like Ned? Speaking of Ned, where did he go? He's got my radio and I want him to finish that podcast. Darkest than I